Welcome to Red, White, and Blue. From the right, I'm Gary Polland. And from the left, I'm David Jones. Tonight we welcome the candidates for Texas Railroad Commissioner. And there are four, and we have three. Jeff Weems, the Democratic candidate. Roger Geary, the Libertarian candidate. And Art Browning, the Green Party candidate. We extended an invitation to Republican candidate David Porter, but because of scheduling conflicts, he was unable to attend. So we'll just have to go with the three, David. I think three's a three's a crowd, and we've got uh, <laughs> we've got we've got an army here. Three's an army, I guess. You should, I guess I should say, Mr. Weems. Let's start with you. Uh, I understand you've been on an oil rig before, a land man and a mud man. How does that qualify for you to be railroad commissioner? Well, the commission regulates field activities. That's a big part of what they do. And so having that experience on the rigs, in the field, is a huge step toward that qualification. The other side of what the commission does is they write up the regulations based off of state law and interpret state law and the regulations, which is a legal task. I've been an energy litigation attorney for over 20 years here in Houston. And I see you have a couple of endorsements of major newspapers, the Chronicle, the Dallas Morning News. Are you, would you say that because of this support that you've seen in editorial boards that you have any advantage in the race thus far? It has been a huge step up. I, I am very proud of receiving both those endorsements. I think our research showed that the last time a statewide Democrat received the endorsement of both the Morning News and the Chronicle was Bob Bullock in 1994. And so I'm very happy to get both of those. But I'm even more proud of getting the endorsement of five of the past six presidents of TIPRO, the independent producers and royalty owners, who usually don't talk to Democrats, and <laughs> the League of Conservation voters. So I'm out talking to all stripes of people in Texas. Gary talks to Democrats. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. talk and to, I'm glad. Talk to one. Huh? <laughs> well, Mr. Gary, uh, you're running as a libertarian candidate? That's correct. Okay. Yes. Why are you running for railroad commissioner? Uh... Mainly because of the ballot access laws in this state. Uh, we, have, we have to run for statewide offices to qualify for the next ballot. And I've been in the railroad and, and um, real estate industries all my life, so railroads sound like a lot of fun, even though the Railroad Commission does not regulate railroads Yeah, and in fact, even longer. though there's talk that they're going to change the name to more accurately reflect what it does today. As they should, yes. So okay. I'm over to you. So is, do you have a libertarian philosophy as to how Texas state government should be operating? Uh, the less, the better. <laughs> okay. Mr. Browning, uh, you're a Green Party candidate. Uh, um, that's right. You want to uh, tell sure. us that you know, you're running only to improve the position of the Green Party in the year 2030? Uh, 2030 is a long way away. I'm looking at 2012. Actually, a lot like a lot like the Libertarians, the ballot access is, it has something to do with it. And uh, you know, when I looked at the uh, various offices, uh, statewide office m that matches my skills and, and uh, uh, talents, if you will, is Railroad Commission. I've been a geologist for th over 35 years, working in the oil industry, and I've been overseas uh, all over the place and seen you know practices good and not so good, and think that I could bring some a uh, little bit of that knowledge to bear in in the regulation of the oil and gas industry. In, in Texas. So you're still active in the industry today? I am a consulting geologist, semi-retired. I do petrophysical analysis, which is, uh, you know, the high technical end, but I've uh, been around engineers and even lawyers uh, with, the, with the work which I've done. Which is a scary thought, yeah, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> a little intimidating, but, you know, there are people, too. They're okay, folks. Let's, let's talk a little bit about, I want to talk a little about the politics of this race. This is okay. a down-ballot race. Yes. It's not high-profile. There's not a lot of money being spent compared to what's being spent, let's say, in the governor's race. Yes. Where the, most of the money is being spent it looks like. So how do you raise above the din so voters, when they decide to vote, and let's say they're discerning voters and they don't vote straight ticket, how, how do you get through that and get people to say, hey, look at me, here I am, and I'm a qualified candidate? In large part, it's online. It has to be, because that's the new media that, that allows low-dollar candidates and down-ticket candidates to reach out to people. And our email list is now over 100,000 people, not bought, not acquired from other folks, but self-generated. Also, a huge aspect of this is going out and talking to people. I've been to 155 counties so far. The rumors this is a big state are true. <laughs> and I will hit another 20 next week as I hit the big country in the Abilene San Angelo area. And getting out and visiting with folks is one of the huge ways of doing that because, quite frankly, in the smaller towns in Texas, as I did an East Texas tour a few weeks ago, 
I was on the front page of virtually every newspaper of every town I visited because it's big news when a statewide candidate goes to Paris, Texas. And so they're happy and they put that out there and you get that earn type media. And those are the big ways of getting your name out when you're down ticket because you are so tethered to the top of the ticket. Whether you want to be or not, you are. So I guess you guys, would it's safe to say, think that you're better qualified than David Porter, who's a CPA living in Giddings, Texas, who says that he gained the job by just emailing a lot of people in the Republican primary last March. And he's also qualified because he has a pipeline on his property where he lives. Well, so, he also, I mean, well. to be fair, David, he also says on his website he worked at, when he, previously to being a CPA. Or while he was a CPA, he had a lot of oil and gas clients in West Texas. I so. think I have two good qualifications in that I've been elected to public office before in uh, Bear County uh, on a countywide race. And my strongest asset is that I don't have any ties to the oil and gas industry. Uh, when staff comes in for a presentation, I, not knowing it, I'll have to ask questions, and I want to hear both sides before I'd make a decision. You know, that's an important thing about the staff, too. I think they get a lot of disrespect. The, the guy at the top is not the one, or the person at the top is not the one who does all the work. The people that, that are in the trenches are the ones that need to be encouraged, and I think that the Railroad Commission is understaffed in terms of the number of people they have who are overlooking the regulations and making sure that things are uh, run safely and, and uh, cleanly. But back to the question, which was about David Porter, he's not qualified. He's a CPA. He's done tax returns for some oil and gas outfits in Midland when he used to live out there. He spent 23 years in Midland, and I'm always trying to keep the record what the record is. But he's not qualified. He doesn't know what he's doing. And it shows in his policy statements, which are there are none, and he has no forward plans. Texas Tribune did a virtual debate between David and myself and put it. I have it up on my website. It's on YouTube also. And he states, he was asked, what do you plan to do when you get on the commission? He said, do whatever the other commissioners say. Hmm. And that's not what we need in Texas right now. So does anybody take the Railroad Commission seriously in the Republican Party? The two that are still there as commissioners have websites where they're running for the United States Senate. Hmm. Now, it's either a full-time job or it's a part-time job. That's what I want to know. And is the Republican Party treating the Railroad Commission like it's a farm team for uh, other offices? Well, it does seem that way. They've always been appointed is how how people get the office there. They don't usually get elected when they're first uh, in office. They get appointed and then move on. And to be fair, this is not a party issue because the Democrats, when they were on the commission, Jim Nugent and the other folks in the past, Buddy Temple was on the commission two weeks and announced for governor. (laughs) And so it's been a stepping stone with both both parties, to be in all fairness. I have proposed legislation uh, with uh, Representative Alan Ritter out of Beaumont to require a railroad commissioner, if they announce for another office, to step down. Hmm. Treat them like a judge. Step down. Also, two about two months after the general election is over, once you're in, close the campaign contribution window and keep it closed for four and a half years because the perception of the public is that the railroad commissions are undu- commissioners are unduly influenced by contributions from the companies being regulated. I propose to close that right away. The Sunset Commission is going to be reviewing early. Uh, the Railroad Commission early. Instead of 2013, the legislature moved it up to 2011. They'll consider whether we should have one commissioner rather than three and whether we should have a name change. Quickly tell us uh, whether we should do any of, of those things and what the name should be. The name should be the Texas Energy Commission or the, maybe it should be even rolled in together. There's a lot of overlap between the TCEQ, Commission on Environmental Quality, and the Railroad Commission are supposed to be taking care of uh, you know clean, clean operations, healthy operations as well. So rethinking those organizations need to be done. Um, and the three commissioners down to one? I, I question that. I think that we need to talk about proportional representation. Having them all be Republicans is a big question. Um, look at our race. It's going to be a winner-take-all. You know, if... if uh, well, with the governor, you get 40 percent. If the other person gets 35, then the 40 percent wins. So we need to talk about different ways of election uh, in terms of uh, instant runoff voting might be the way to go. Also, proportional representation. If you have three offices, then you could have a Republican, a Democrat, and then a Libertarian or a Green. I think that uh, having one commissioner would put too much power in one person's uh, bailiwick. Well, how about this question? Do we really need a railroad commission in modern Texas? <laughs> yes, you do. Uh, without the railroad commission, you would find oil and gas drilling and production activity in Texas grind to a screeching halt. The, the oil and gas industry in Texas is our biggest employer. 
It is one of our biggest sources of tax revenue, if not the biggest one. You have to keep it strong, but you have to watch over it. And I would like to jump back real quick in that because I do disagree with Mr. Browning on this. Keep it three commissioners. You have conflicts of interest issue where a commissioner may have worked for a company that has an issue coming up in front of it. If you just have one commissioner, you don't have someone who can handle this and who handles it then. But also, change the name to the Oil and Gas Commission. That's 95% of what they do. Call it what it does. Calling it the Energy Commission is equally confusing because they don't do anything with electricity, with wind, with solar. They ought to, but they don't. So why have it even as an elected position? It started out, it was a position where the governor appointed uh, the member or members of the Railroad Commission. Well, what's wrong with having a sort of a cabinet level uh, government in Texas that includes a Railroad Commission? I would much rather see, see an elected body uh, there's been quite a controversy about the Trans-Texas Corridor, which is under TxDOT, which is a non-elected body. Do we want the oil and gas industry to be in on a, uh, regulated by a non, non-elected body? Well, I think not. Governor Hogg almost lost his job in 1892 because of the fact that it was initially appointed, and everyone accused him. The first railroad commissioner was Senator John Reagan who left the Senate in, the, in Washington and came down to become the first railroad commissioner. He was appointed. And one of the first things that happened in 1892 is they passed legislation and passed a constitutional amendment to require them to be elected because people did not trust what was going Which on. Which raises, by the way, an interesting question for all of you. Because mm-hmm. we mentioned, uh, you know, electricity not regulated by elected officials. It's done by appointed officials, the environment not regulated by elected officials, but regulated by appointed officials. Do we need to really take a look at the Railroad Commission and and broaden what it does and and bring under its wing electricity regulation, environmental regulation? And that way the voters would have an opportunity to impact on that uh, with their officials. I have proposed that down the line, until I would like the PUC, the TCEQ, and the Railroad Commission to learn how to do their own jobs first, and once they do, then wrap them all together, and I propose to call it the Texas Commission on Energy and Environment, have five commissioners, three elected, two appointed. The two appointed ones I would want to have so we could have someone who's appointed who really knew electricity Mm -hmm. and have someone who's appointed who really knew the environment, and then the other three are elected by the public at large and have this blended agency that you handle all these things. Because as Art mentioned, there are some conflicts between between the TCQ and the Railroad Commission, and unfortunately what happens is both agencies tend to walk away, put their hands in the air, and say, that's not my job, and then the EPA steps in, which is an utter disaster for Texas. And, and that's an interesting uh, concept, because what you're talking about, of course, is reducing the power of the governor by taking away those ap- appointed jobs uh, for PUC, uh, Public Utility Commission, for the Environmental uh, CEQ, we're, we're taking that away, and, and re- actually reducing uh, cabinet government, uh, I think someone mentioned that, and increasing the ability of the voters to vote. So, so many, t- so many times mm-hmm. these, these experts in these fields come out of the industry they're supposed to regulate. They regulate for a while and then they go back into that industry again. Well, guess what kind of regulation you're going to get? Mm-hmm. Industry friendly, huh? Is uh, that, would that be it? Very much so. We've okay. never had a railroad commissioner from Houston, is what I'm understanding. And Mr. Weems says that he no, no, is a Dave, Democrat. Duhurst, wasn't Dave, no, Duhurst wasn't railroad uh, Dave, commissioner. Mr. Weems says that not only that, but we've had Republican commissioners for a good while, and we have a federal regulatory agency that is run by, you know, a, a an, an administration that is Democratic. Do we need a Democrat on the Railroad Commission simply because of that, as Mr. Weems is suggesting? I would say absolutely yes in the answer to that. Do we need a Democrat on the Railroad Commission? Absolutely. Well, how does it help? What, here's one of the ways that I believe it would help is I am very pro-industry. Been in it my whole life, third generation in the oil and gas industry. I, they need to be watched over because we saw what happened offshore when regulators aren't watching over what's going on. But maybe, just maybe, if you look at things that are coming out of Washington now, the, the FRAC Act, in other words, federal regulation of hydraulic fracturing, the cap and trade bill as it was written and proposed, those were both horrible bills. And they were written poorly and they would have been devastating to Texas had they go through or if they do go through down the line. Maybe, just maybe, if Democrats are in, tr- in control in Washington, a Democratic railroad commissioner who has industry experience can go talk to them and get entry into the room to visit with them and say, here's why your cap and trade bill is no good. You don't punish natural gas. You promote natural gas. It's the cleanest burning fossil fuel. Let's promote it. Don't punish it and give all the goodies 
to the coal states because that's where the Democratic senators happen to reside. Well, we happen to have Democratic congressmen from Texas who I, it, it seems like were pretty ineffective in impacting the Obama administration in the, in the areas you talked about. And let's add to it, they also failed to stop the ridiculous uh, ban on offshore drilling that was put into effect by Obama, which obviously I, I would assume that all of you were against. That made no sense. I'm against that for a reason that's very different from what most people. Well, I'm interested in fact, in my greens, my green friends were mostly in favor of stopping offshore drilling. But what happens when we stop our offshore drilling here is that we export our problems to other countries that don't have as good environmental controls, like Nigeria. We aren't addressing our overconsumption problems. We're not cutting back on consumption. We're just saying, okay, we'll go drill somewhere else. In fact, I've been hearing that the Gulf Coast, residents of the Gulf Coast feel the same way about California. Why don't you drill off California? Why are you exporting your problems over to the Gulf Coast? Well, and the other thing, of course, you know, the Cuba has just given rights to <laughs> the Chinese to drill off there, <laughs> which, which if it's done sloppily, will end up on exactly. the Florida coast. And right. Yes. So, and and we need to the, clean up our own act first. Moratorium, horrible idea. And, and currently, in the state of Texas, you have cities, such as the city of Flower Mound, which, sensing that they were getting no help from the Railroad Commission and the Railroad Commissioners did not have enough field inspectors out there to really do their job, they've issued a moratorium. In their jurisdiction and their ETJ, no drilling allowed. And they've just extended it recently. And that's a direct result from the failure of the Railroad Commission to get out there and do its job. But back to what your question had been. When you have the, our state, our congressman, the Democrat congressman from Texas, they didn't have good support. They certainly had no Republican railroad commissioners up there helping them out. And so maybe, just maybe, no one's told me they'll listen to me, but I tend to be kind of loud and fairly persistent. You're talking about the cap-and-trade vote that we had? Is that? Yes. 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 Well, you know, there were Democratic uh, senators in the Northeast and from coal-producing states who agreed, as I remember, with the Clean Air Act uh, passed by George Bush in 1990. That was a cap-and-trade bill that eliminated acid rain. So what is wrong with the concept of cap and trade, given that Republicans once endorsed it? The concept of cap and trade is a legitimate concept, but the manner and me mechanism that they were using this time, which was to give credits out to certain industries, the coal industry was, I think the number was, they were assigned a 34% responsibility for uh, carbon emissions. They were given 34% of the credits. Oil and gas industry was assigned 42% of the responsibility and was given 2% of the credits. It was an entire burden, and it would have it would have crippled Texas. That's politics, and, David. It wasn't a cap and, and trade. And it was, just, it was poorly, poorly written. The concept, though, I agree, needs to be addressed, and it apparently will continue to be well, addressed. Well, some thoughtful people have said that instead of cap and trade, we need to look at some kind of carbon. Tax. That's more like it. The, the cap and trade just moves the bean around. It doesn't take the beans off the table. It just puts them under cups and moves them around. And, and by the way, we have, and with us, I think we've learned when there are subsidies to encourage energy conservation, people take advantage of it. So, mm -hmm. I mean, there yes, were subsidies to buy hybrid cars, uh, and they're all gone because people took them, David. I, I, subsidies I, I, to get <laughs> improve your uh, windows in your home or your insulation to reduce energy consumption, people take advantage of it. So there is a smart way to do that. Maybe that's where the stimulus money should have gone to, David, but instead of God knows where. I, I hear a lot of people think that, that seem to think the, the problems with the world is that we don't have enough regulation. I think we need to revisit that. I, I, I would propose that, in fact, I think we have too many regulations. Uh, that worked for the Gulf of Mexico, certainly. And speaking of... <laughs> yeah, well, no, they didn't do anything. They had regulations. It didn't matter. Speaking of subsidies, though, one of my proposals is that with the Rail Railroad Commission has a little program inside of it called AFRED right now, Alternative Fuels uh, Research and Education. They're the Hank Hill guys. They're the propane guys. When a school bus fleet converts to propane, the Railroad Commission will write a subsidy check for part of that process, and it's been very successful, very beneficial. I propose to expand that into natural gas fueling outlets. Right now, there are 15 places in the state of Texas where a, where an individual consumer like us can fill up a car that runs on natural gas. Oklahoma has almost 70. That is ridiculous. Oklahoma state government is actively helping subsidize and helping reduce the cost, the entry cost, to people to put those in place. And then once you do that, once you build the infrastructure for natural gas-powered vehicles, then you're reducing your carbon output because natural gas burns so much cleaner than gasoline. Well, how much interest is there in, in Austin to, to do this? None right now because of the budget crunch. Right now, people are hunkering down and battening down the hatches. But the, one of the, two, the, the two things I want to do is that, 
the, the subsidy for the, the gas stations, for natural gas fueling outlets, and let's start stopping some of those long trains of Wyoming coal that are coming down for our power plants, and let's start converting these power plants one at a time to burn Texas natural gas. You'll, subs you'll, you'll build your base for your market for natural gas. There's jobs there. You'll build jobs in converting these power plants, and you drop your carbon footprint 30 40%. It's a win-win-win situation. I'd agree with you 100% about stopping those uh, tar sand pipelines coming down. That's that's crazy, bringing it, bringing it all the way down here when we've got plenty of yeah. energy here. Just got to use it. Let's say there's a pipeline that blows up, as it did in California, and incinerates uh, 40, 50 houses and eight people. Who, do, who would we blame if that were to happen in Texas? It could have happened. It did. It has. It has. Up in Dallas-Fort Worth area, there was a pipeline. And I remember uh, not many, many de decades ago, there was one up in uh, up Waller, Waller. 10, 15 years ago, there was one there. Now, it's to nobody's advantage to, do, to have those things happen. I think that transparency in the inspections and monitoring of the pipeline pressure should be uh, increased so that we see what the p companies are doing. They don't want to have pipelines blow up either. It's a waste of their resources. And we have a problem with pipelines yeah. getting older, too. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. If it's an interstate pipeline, it's regulated by the federal. Federal Energy mm -hmm. Regulatory Commission by FERC. If it's in tri-state or if it's a local distribution network, it's regulated by the Railroad Commission and inspected by the Railroad Commission. That's one of their chief marching orders mm -hmm. is safety of distribution networks. Atmos Energy, the delivery company in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, had huge problems for the last five or six years. They had old compression couplings that had a rubber gasket. The rubber desiccates, it cracks open, and the gas leaked and it was blowing houses up and killing people. The Railroad Commission, just this year, just this last month finally issued proposals for decision to require them to change over to a plastic pipe. Now the, the tyranny in that is the chance that they're going to pass all that cost plus a profit margin onto the consumer. I think that's a railroad commission's job to see what is the fair appropriate or apportionment of that cost and I don't think that's been done yet. Does the commission have the personnel to do its job in, in, with respect to the inspection of pipelines? Hmm. No. Absolutely not. Not for field inspections on drilling and not for pipelines at all. And again, it's a tough issue. And that's, I think, Paul Burke in Texas Monthly wrote that he wants to get rid of the Railroad Commission because there's just not enough people doing their jobs. Well, the, <laughs> that, the, I, I don't agree with his philosophy or his approach. His logic was a little bit faulty in there in that the folks who are out there working are doing a yeoman's job. The workers at the Railroad Commission are outstanding. They need support from the commissioners. They need the commissioners to get in front of the legislature and yell and scream and bark and get as much money as possible. It may not be more money, but certainly fight against the cuts that mm -hmm. keep coming. Right. And one of the ways that they can reapportion money inside the Railroad Commission to get more field inspectors, let's finish the automation process for the filing system right now. Right now, it is a Byzantian task in the Railroad Commission to file something. It's all paperwork. It's a mess. Get that automated so people can file that. You can get those clerk positions, that clerk money, and redirect that to the field where you can have people keeping folks safe. That's crazy. Yeah, my meter reader has a has a little computer. You know, the guy. That well, that's because that's because government, <laughs> and you know, maybe we should outsource the whole whole, oh, thing, whole railroad that. commission to the private sector. Yeah. Well, when you uh, that'd when be a libertarian <laughs> idea. When you have somebody like the, the the railroad commission putting all these regulations out, it's too easy for the pipeline company to hide behind that and say, "Hey, we lived up to all the regulations," instead of accepting the full liability that. It was their pipeline, it blew up, they're fully liable to make restitution. Well, that's where I say transparency is important. It's not doing away with the regulators. It's making everything clear and all out in the open. With the Internet, we could have every, every inspection up there for everybody to look at all the time. Another thing that needs inspections is not just pipelines, but also old wells, old abandoned wells. We've got a situation up in Conroe where uh, Jeff knows a lot about this, actually, where inject going to inject waste, water well, waste into a well, and we really need to understand uh, not only the reservoirs, are there fractures in there, but also are there communication with the groundwater through abandoned wells. That's another job that the Lots Railroad Commission has is inspections of abandoned wells. There are. I just wanted to comment real quickly how impressed I was that I just heard a libertarian candidate really argue in favor of more lawsuits. And so that's for a <laughs> well, lawyer. That's the private that's sector. Kind of, that's, kind of, that's kind of music well, to a lawyer, so yeah, to a litigator's yeah, ears, yeah, yeah, especially. I hope you don't need them, but how, sometimes uh, it's necessary. I just want to know quickly, does anybody know how enthusiastic Mr. Victor Carrillo, the remaining commissioner we haven't discussed who was just defeated, how enthusiastic is he about doing his job, given that he's just been tossed out 60-40 in the Republican primary? He has been working a yeoman's job in Austin now. He has been really 
heavily dedicated to his job because I have a lot of friends at the commission, a lot of folks I know, and he mm -hmm. has been staying there burning the midnight oil. And it's interesting, he's been doing that while Michael Williams and Elizabeth Jones have been out campaigning for Senate. And he's been really working hard. I've been very impressed with him. Been sure. doing a good job with that. And that Jones is no relation to me. I, I, you I sure? Won't, I won't be voting. I'm just from I won't be voting for him. All right. So briefly, we got about a minute left. The politics of 2010. This is the whole politics and the political climate's changed mm -hmm. dramatically from 2008. Yes. Uh, in 2008, we know it was a Democratic landslide essentially. Uh, in 2010, there's been a reaction, and the voters at this point appear to be going the other way. So. Uh, for each of you, how does that impact on your ability to win? And now we're down to 30 seconds, so you got 10 seconds. Outstand it's an outstanding year because the mood in Texas is anti-incumbent, as I've seen all around the state. And since the Republicans hold every statewide office, they're the incumbents, I think they're in trouble. Gary? Five seconds. Browning? <laughs> winning for me is 5% yeah, yeah. of the vote. Also, I'd like to talk about the governor, 2%. If the governor gets 2%, then the Green Party will be on the ballot in 2012. Okay. Thank you, Weems Democrat, Gary Libertarian, Browning. We could tell by the ties from the Green Party. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being with us tonight. It's been a great show. You. Uh, you guys can watch the show again if you want by vid visiting us online at HoustonPBS.org. And check on the program bar, Red, White, and Blue. Read about our guests, watch the shows, follow up discussion. And until next time, get informed and get active.